Thank you, Dr. Bussy Jones. Good morning, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. I'm Kimi Fatade, as you've heard. I'm super excited um, to be coming to you today and talking about one of my favorite parts of my experience this last four years, um, which is our facilitated peer mentorship group, a novel model for promoting equitable and inclusive mentoring for underrepresented trainees in academic medicine, what we titled the Oguni Research Group by our um, wonderful, wonderful uh, faculty leader, Dr. Modeli Oguni. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to you about this today. So these, this is my disclosure. And our objectives for today, so we want to identify barriers affecting inclusion of underrepresented minority trainees in academic medicine, as well as the challenges to the traditional mentorship model in academic institutions. And then we want to define our new model for promoting equitable and inclusive mentoring and assess the effectiveness of this new model. And so when we talk about mentorship in academic medicine, there are multiple areas um, that this affects that we have to consider. One is personal and professional development. So we know that mentorship in academic medicine is critical to success. It's linked with publication and grant success. It's linked with research productivity, career development. We know for the institution, having successful mentorship is also important. It's linked to grant funding and promotions. And also for patient care, and this is an important aspect that I think Think, um, we often don't consider, but diversity in the healthcare workforce um, and having mentorship to promote that diversity really enhances access to care for certain patients, reduces health disparities, and improves the quality of care for underserved populations, especially Black patients. There's been a lot of recent research that's shown us that race concordance and the impact of race concordance in improving outcomes, particularly for Black patients. There was a recent JAMA study that told us that Black Black people live longer when they are in counties with more Black doctors. So diversity and mentorship is a really important aspect of academic mentorship medicine. So what do we have right now in the contemporary cardiology workforce? We know that only 5.8% are Hispanic, 4.2% are Black, 34 total in the country are American Indian or Alaskan Native. And of women, um, for women, only 15.5% of women are cardiologists. And of the women cardiologists, only 10.1% are electrophysiologists and 8.2% interventional cardiologists. So we've got, we've got some work to do. And so what are the best Barriers. What are the things that are preventing us from doing that work? The barriers to diversity and inclusion in cardiovascular fellowship training programs. We know we have slow adaptation of the evidence-based strategies that we've heard of and have seen publications about. Uh, we know there's lack of role models, lack of mentors, uh, there's lack of diverse mentorship, and so many more of these barriers that you see on here. But one that I really want to highlight is, is this. Most training programs support a traditional one-to-one -one mentor to mentor parent model, um, which may disproportionately affect underrepresented trainees. So again, race and ethnic concordance in mentorship also leads to those objective outcomes, promotion, grant funding, and underrepresented trainees often have a lower faculty cardiologist pool to select mentors from. So when you start trying to fit everyone into that traditional one-to-one -one mentor to mentee parent model, you can often have underrepresented trainees disproportionately affected, not have successful mentorship. And so we really need to look into innovative models to challenge the traditional mentorship gaps. And uh, we need to look at the implications of this kind of multi-level peer mentorship approach, because we don't know what those implications are yet. <clears throat> So in comes our solution, the Oguni Research Group, which is a novel facilitated peer mentoring group. Um, so this facilitated peer mentoring system is for trainees from Emory, Morehouse, and other academic institutions. Our mission is to advance cardiovascular health and equity through research, advocacy, and service. And we have a group right now of 26 trainees that make us make up four teams of interns and residents and medical students, as well as team leaders 
leaders that are senior residents and cardiology fellows that serve as co-facilitators. And we have our lead mentor and facilitator, which is our cardiology attendant. And we'll talk more about how the structure works. But what we do with our group, well, we have virtual bi-monthly meetings where we discuss research projects, we discuss career development. Um, we have quarterly academic research series, and these are really important to build the research toolkit of the trainees and to empower them with different research uh, capabilities. And then the mentees are asked to complete individual development plans, um, which kind of highlight their personal and professional goals. And these are updated yearly and reviewed with the lead mentor, as well as receive one-on-one -on -one mentorship and complete a yearly continuing contract if they want to continue in the group. So lots of opportunities uh, for meeting, for leadership, for mentorship, and for scholarly work. And again, this is kind of the basic model, which is we have a lead mentor, cardiologist, supported by co-facilitators, cardiology fellows, and then resident-led teams, um, which are a diverse array of medical students, interns, and residents. And this is, oh, it's, it's not showing up uh, as well in this picture, but this is just my pictorial depiction of our group. And you can see we really are kind of rooted in these five tenets, the tenets of leadership, scholarship, community, mentorship, and service. Um, those tenets are, are the tenets that our uh, lead uh, attending and mentor use to kind of guide the cardiology fellows as they co-facilitate the groups, the four groups um, of resident teams. And we have, again, the resident leaders that hold the leadership of each group. Um, and then we see that there's just a beautiful array of a mix of medical students and residents and interns that really bring the diversity, diversity of, of uh, knowledge, of background, of experience to these teams. And so for the last uh, few minutes that I have, I want to go into how well have we done at, accom at accomplishing some of these tenets that we have of our group. So I'll start um, I'll start with leadership. And this is just a screenshot of one of our virtual team meetings that we have. And in terms of leadership, the ORG really provides inclusive leadership opportunities. Um, so we allow the, the resident members to plan and lead the team research meetings. They're not led by our uh, uh, major mentor. They're not led by the co-facilitators. They're all resident-led. And they also plan and moderate the academic uh, research series and seminars, which are open to the public. So we have various attendees from all over the country attend these uh, academic research series meetings. So this is one way that we encourage leadership among the members of the Oguni Research Group. And then I want to talk about mentorship. So one-on-one -on -one mentoring by the lead mentor is a critical aspect of uh, the mentorship in our group. And it's not easy, right, when you have 26 trainees, but somehow Dr. Oguni manages to do it. And it is not just, you know, word of mouth. This, these, these are pictures showing you that she literally meets with each trainee. And this is so critical to the success of every single trainee. And um, in addition to that, we have uh, peer mentorship um, within our groups. Uh, we have co-mentoring through our group interactions, and that allows us to access the different strengths of each member. And then finally, we want to talk about scholarship. And as you can see, just by this one picture, we, we've, been, we've been productive. Um, so we've had over 15 abstracts just in the last, uh, over 16 abstracts just in the last two years um, of, of our research group. And each member, you know, is asked to have a measurable academic achievement and research productivity, either through public publications, presentations, scholarship awards, and um, these are just some of our residents uh, at the American College of Cardiology. You can see here in the top left, this is a medical student presenting a complex clinical case um, at the American College of Cardiology National Conference. Um, and then we, we've also had a lot of our members win awards, win scholarships, and I'll, I'll just highlight just a few of them. Um, well, uh, first, I'll say we had 100% cardiology fellowship match, um, as well as 100% residency match so far with our medical students. Um, and then we've also had a lot of our residents supported by the American College of Cardiology Internal Medicine Cardiology Program. So we've had a 100% acceptance rate to that program by uh, all of our mentees. Um, a lot of our mentees have also received uh, the scholarship from the Association of Black Cardiologists to attend ACC. And then I have to just, you know, really how, how 
highlight some of these impressive, and you can see this is just a brief picture of some of these imp impressive accomplishments, but I'll say Dr. Martin Campbell won Georgia American College of Physicians Top Abstract Award in 2022. Our medical student, Ryan Arrington, won the Minority White Co-Foundation 2022 Healthcare Scholarship. Um, uh, Dr. Aisha Mustafa won the Robert A. Wynn Diversity in Clinical Trials Career Development Award and Research Grant, which allows her to develop and implement her own trial, Smart Step Trial at Grady, um, which will focus on peripheral arterial disease. Dr. Nathan Steele is a heart failure clinical trial co-investigator, and he also uh, was the winner of the National Medical Fellowships Diversity in Clinical Trials uh, Research Award. Our fellow, Alexis Oko, um, has served as the AHA-funded Better Center Fellow, and then the following year, he kind of, you know, helped guide one of our residents, Alan Sangi, who is now going to be the new Better Center Fellow as he starts his fellowship. So as you can see, this is just um, in terms of, of a comp uh, scholarship and, and academic achievement, our group has just um, really gone above and beyond. And just the mentorship from one generation to the other, passing along their knowledge um, is, is has been critical. And finally, I'll say community, community, community. A lot of times we focus on just accomplishments uh, for underrepresented trainees, but th there's, there's, a, in, there's an importance to the wellness uh, of the trainee and the, the facilitators and the lead mentors really fostering that wellness and not just seeing us kind of as, you know, people that put out, put out products, right, but really seeing us as a whole. And these are just opportunities that we've had to have some uh, community and some togetherness. You can see this picture in the lower left was when my baby was just like two months old and we had her Oguni research group meeting. And uh, really this last, last slide just emphasizes, this is just the last two years, y'all. We are really a family. And um, we've, you know, been in uh, uh, each other's weddings. Uh, we've seen each other's babies. Um, and it's just been a, a fantastic family, not just a, a group, but really a, a fantastic family that encourages not just your professional development, but your personal development. And so I thank you for giving me an opportunity to go on about uh, something that's so near and dear to my heart. I want to just especially thank our, our lead mentor again, Dr. Oguni, just for her endless giving, because you really cannot have programs like this on, unless you have a faculty that have some buy-in and believe in um, the future and, and, and uh, what the mentees can do. So thank you to Dr. Oguni and thank you all for listening. <clears throat> I said, yeah, let me unmute myself. Sorry about that. Good morning. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bussy Jones, and to everybody who just took the time out to be here this morning. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about one of our um, educational initiatives in the Department of Medicine through our DEI team that we're very proud of. And this is called From Pivot to Progress, the Rise Virtual Visiting Student Mini Clerkship, which you heard Dr. Bussy Jones mention earlier. I have no disclosures. But I'd like to start with just a quick story. Um, this is me back in the day, along with our uh, Chief of Health Equity at Grady Hospital, Dr. Yolanda Wimberly, when we were students at Meharry Medical College, just coming out of our M3 year and getting ready for M4 year. And for those of, uh, those of you who remember this time, you know it's a really expensive time. Um, we had application fees that we were trying to pay for, interviews we were trying to figure out. We were paying for step two for away rotations, which we desired to do. There was room and board that you had to pay for, interview travel. And then there was just time, which we now recognize is a real luxury. And so there was this thing being passed around at Meharry called the list. And the list was a list of places where you could do an away rotation that had a substantial stipend. And so we went through that list, not so much because of the programs where we wanted to go, but because we needed the money um, and so one of those programs included uh, one that was led by our former Surgeon General and former President of Meharry Medical College, David Satcher, the Douglas Satcher Clerkship at University Hospitals of Cleveland Case Western. And I would enroll for that program for, with its $2,500 stipend and ultimately find myself there. Now, why was this something that was happening to us as a group of students at a historically black college? There's some things that uh, we did not have that many people do have who are medical students. We lacked generational wealth. There were things that we just were not aware of. And some of that awareness comes through social capital. You don't know what you don't know. And sometimes access to programs and to opportunities 
come just from that social capital, but also there's financial capital, right? So for example, my son who's graduating from high school this year, finished a summer program at Wharton at University of Pennsylvania. I knew about it through social capital. I was able to get him there through financial capital, right? And again, this open door through this program allowed me to match ultimately at Case Western, simply because I signed up because I didn't have the money. So what is meant by diversity, equity, and inclusion? Because this is something we think about a lot as it relates to our diversity initiatives. And I like to simplify this for all of you. When we talk about diversity, what we're really talking about is representation or who's there, who's present. Equity is slightly different. How is power operating? That is, who has ownership and is able to move things forward? And then inclusion, who is participating? That is the engagement piece. So you hear us using that word more and more. And as we think about those who are underrepresented in medicine, again, I like to simplify these ideas for you. Think of um, one group in the population or the group to which you belong as y'all. Now, how many of y'all are doctors? If the number of y'all in the community lines up with the number of y'all who are doctors, that means you're well represented. Now, take a person like me who's a black American, the number of y'all in the, in the general population may be one amount, but how many are doctors? And we call this underrepresentation. And as it is defined by the double AMC, that is specifically individuals who are black, um, who identify as Native American, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Asian Pacific Islanders. So um, we already heard um, some of our prior presenters talk about the importance of patient outcomes when it comes to um, increasing representation in our physician workforce. So I won't spend a lot of time there, but I'll just say if you have a lot of excellent baseball players, all of whom are catchers, your team won't win, right? You need a little diversity within those uh, on your team. And so, like many programs, including the one that uh, I met that brought me to my residency program, when Dr. Bussey Jones and I stepped into our leadership role, one of the first things we wanted to do is create a Department of Medicine DEI clerkship, very similar to the models that um, I participated in back in 1995. These are designed to increase access to URIM students. Um, they're very, very common. Um, so we initiated one of these at Emory. It was very typical of the ones we'd seen before, and we also offered a substantial stipend. However, what we didn't account for was that COVID would hit. And once COVID hit, all of this went away. We only made it through one year of our very first um, DOM DEI clerkship. So again, just as a timeline, Dr. Bussey Jones and I late in the spring of 2018 were appointed in our leadership roles after um, <clears throat> rolling out our strategic plan as a part of that initiative included our first DOM DEI clerkship. Um, this was the first student that we brought to our program. It was successful. It was in person at Grady, but then came COVID in March of 2020, and we were forced then to think about what we would do to pivot. And because we're a group of thinkers, we came up with this idea of a virtual visiting mini clerkship, which rolled out for the first time in August of 2020. So our pivot to this new program, it actually solved a few of the problems that actually make it challenging for those from historically excluded or groups where you do not have access to um, generational wealth. So it was a two week ungraded mini clerkship. Why did that matter? Part of the piece that matters is that when you apply for an away clerkship and anyone who did one knows this, that there's something called the visiting student application service. It, it costs money, it is a, um, it is a a process and an administrative hump to get over. Um, but for this, we were able to, uh, because it was ungraded and it did not involve a clinical facing component, we could skip the VSAS application and the paperwork there. It did not involve travel. We did not have an application fee. And we even offered a stipend at the end for this web-based program. And so in getting started back in 2020, again, we were under pandemic restrictions. And so we came up with some simple criteria as we first rolled this out. First, the individuals have to self-identify as underrepresented in medicine by those double AMC definitions I shared with you previously. They had to submit a completed application, which included a transcript, letter of recommendation, and also a transcript of their USMLE score. And then um, they needed to be a current M4 at an accredited US medical school applying to internal medicine. And so um, 
how did we get people to know about this? Because again, from the start of COVID to us rolling this out was a very short period of time. And as many know, I like social media and, and recognize its power. So we really use social media and word of mouth to get this word out. And one big piece of social media included showing images of what we had in mind and what we were doing. And so here's just one. Of course, one. it's a beautiful Clip. day at Grady Hospital. And I just want to remind you again about our amazing opportunity for our virtual visiting mini clerkship. We have two rounds, it's a two week mini clerkship and more than just being exposed to places like Grady without having to leave your home, it's also really an opportunity for your development. Do you wanna learn um, how to shine on your interview? Do you wanna learn about narrative medicine, clinical reasoning? Do you wanna be exposed to all of our amazing teaching sites? Then you should apply. Now this program is specifically targeting those from underrepresented backgrounds, um, but it is an intimate environment. We spend a lot of time with you. You men meet a lot of folks and you get a lot of mentoring. Um, I can't wait to meet you. The application is in this tweet and um, I have to go around because my resident is calling me, but hey, if you come here, you'll get to meet my resident too, who's really awesome by the way. All right, y'all, bye. So we use this opportunity to warm up our program and and sh and, and show people the program in ways that the, the in person visit didn't before so here's just an example of some parts of what the program looked like, so you may notice here that our time on zoom is not the full day. We started off with these morning coffees with these meet and greets we did sessions on um, some of our forward facing programs like our distinctions and teaching continuity clinic experiences and then time with residents and fellows, for example, you'll see the bottom this subspecialty life fun with fellows and friends and so we we made this flexible so that if you were on another rotation it could actually work with another rotation we thought about cognitive load right we cannot have you on zoom all day from nine all the way until five um, you got an opportunity to be exposed to multiple sites so our very first um, Rye Scholar that came to us in person, he was in on a rotation at Grady and he knew the team he was working with at Grady, but he didn't really get a chance to get exposed to as many people as he is the individuals who participated in this program. Because it's a small cohort and they are with each other for two weeks, they build relationships and it's really quite fun. So here are just some of the, um, the images that show some of our cohorts. Um, this picture with, with the two people here is uh, me with Casey Hornbuckle, one of our students from the last cohort and our mock interview, um, a really powerful relationship building tool that affirmed our students. So our outcomes in 2020, we brought in 11 scholars. We had three two week blocks and three students matched at Emory. And if you know anything about visiting clerkships, matching three out of 11 people who came to visit is amazing. In 2021, we had eight scholars, zero matched at Emory, but stay with me, I'll share with you um, some things that we learned. In 2022, we moved to a two two week block set section with two two five group um, cohorts and three of those students matched at Emory. But we realized that it was more than just the recruitment process that mattered. In fact, all of the attendees told us that they reported ranking Emory in their top three programs, which was quite significant. We learned a lot of lessons. So two two week blocks proved to be more ideal. The marketing um, experience. Um, being more than just recruitment was was important if you notice in that little video clip i showed you i talked about us mentoring you us coaching you so that we would draw people to the program not just who specifically were trying to get recruited to emory but who wanted some professional development right we also um, learned that the sessions with our current trainees were very important and that this program strengthened the reputation of the institution that matters because who will apply to your program often comes from word of mouth. And even if a person did not match at Emory, if they had this positive experience with us through this program, um, they, they may um, have other people behind them apply. It showed our culture of inclusivity. It's sustainable beyond the pandemic. We did this out of necessity, but quickly learned that it proved to be something that was very, very um, helpful to our recruitment process. In our first cohort, we matched a student who came to us from UC Davis, um, and we had people apply to us and join us from places that maybe would not have come if it was an away rotation, especially considering some of those features that I shared with you before that I considered as a medical student. But also they built longitudinal relationships and the social media presence was quite, quite critical. 
Um, and here's just some of the outcomes. And so this is in 2022, this year's cohort, we matched three students um, of our, of our um, cohort of 10 this year, which we're very proud of. But I wanna show you something else. On match day, every single student who participated in our, in our match, I mean, in our um, group, every single one of those students personally contacted me with an image to tell me where they matched. And that was, again, because we built a mentoring relationship that was beyond just trying to recruit you to Emory. They also had very favorable things to say about the program. They described the professional development aspect was the most beneficial to them. They said things like the very number of people they got to meet and interact with. Remember, they were seeing people at different sites. The most benef beneficial aspect of the program was receiving feedback on the interview process, right? And then here are some of the individuals who did not match with us and some of the um, communication that we got. I'm glad I was able to have an interview with you to practice. Hello, Dr. Manning. I matched at Duke. I am. I truly have to thank you. The RISE program and you especially truly helped shape and build me up for the interview season. Here's another student who matched at Columbia. After this summer, Emory holds a dear place in my heart and I'm thankful for the opportunity. I hope we stay in touch as I have zero doubt our paths are gonna cross to continue in the future. And listen, I'm playing the long game. This is an individual who wants to do cardiology. If you think one of these individuals will not end up here for a fellowship, um, I think you're wrong. And I think, again, this matters a lot to our institutional reputation. So in summary, um, a virtual mini clerkship is an option and especially considering the financial landscape we're in right now where we are cutting budgets. It's a great opportunity for access um, for learners, particularly those who do not have the same social and financial capital. Um, there's no financial expense to the participant. I will say the biggest piece is it's a heavy administrative time commitment, but um, I'm fortunate that our, in our department, our chair has given me protected time to dedicate to this. So you would, to reproduce this, need someone with dedicated time to be able to do this. There's a higher level of exposure to faculty than you would have in just a traditional one-to-one um, -one rotation visit. And then it doesn't exclude in-person rotation. You can still do this program and come for an in-person rotation if you like. Um, it does not involve clinical exposure, but places are made up of people and we firmly believe that the people component is a huge aspect of what has made us so successful in the recruitment process. I think that M4Me would have really appreciated an opportunity to see more um, than just the one site that I saw at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital back in 1995. And I think this is something that other programs can do and reproduce and um, again, um, not have the same financial heavy lift. So I'd like to just say thank you for, um, for this presentation and acknowledge specifically um, Dr. Bussey Jones, our program coordinator, Kia Dodd, and former program coordinator, John Otis Blanding, who really helped us get this off the ground. Aaron Lee from HR, who's been tremendously supportive, our chair, our um, DOM RISE Council, the Emory CDIC Church World Diversity and Inclusion Collective residents who have been truly transformative in helping us with recruitment and all of our DOM faculty here who participated. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. <clears throat> okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarush. I'm a uh, general surgery resident from Memphis, currently on a two-year research fellowship here at Emory working under Dr. Randy Smith, and I'm also pursuing my MPH during this time. I'll be presenting our project entitled Understanding Patterns of Firearm-Related Injury to Inform Targeted Hospital-Based Violence Reduction Strategies in Atlanta, Georgia. So in terms of disclosures, um, myself and uh, Dr. Courtney Meyer are both supported by um, T32 uh, training grants under the NIH. So within the US, uh, trauma represents the number one cause of death among people ages one to 44. Violent injury is a major cause of death among youth, but there are huge disparities in who's actually affected. The charts on the slide represent the proportion of injury-related deaths among those ages 15 to 34. The chart on the left shows data for all races except Black. Specifically, it's showing um, white, Asian, and Pacific Islander, and Native American and Alaska Native races. And the chart on the right is showing data for the same age group, but only for uh, Black race. And you can notice how homicide makes up the majority of injury-related deaths in Black individuals at 45%, but it only accounts for 8.3% uh, of injury-related deaths among all other races. And this massive disparity in homicides between races can be overstated with 
black individuals bearing the highest burden. Firearm related injury in particular shows a high level of disparity by race and the image on the left tries to illustrate this. When compared to their white counterparts, uh, black youth are three times more likely to experience fatal police shootings, 10 times more likely to experience firearm related homicide and 18 times more likely to experience firearm related injury. Social and structural determinants of health are important drivers that influence disparities. Um, as I'm sure most folks in this um, call know, social determinants of health are the conditions of the environment that people live in that impact their um, health outcomes. And with regard to um, firearm related violence and deaths, social determinants at play can include um, economic opportunity, access to education, access to healthcare, and overall neighborhood characteristics. Um, in the and uh, structural determinants of health are higher level socioeconomic and political factors that influence health disparities. In the case of firearm related violence, this includes government practices such as redlining, which historically defined who could get loans depending on their race and where they lived, and which continues to have repercussions today, as well as economic policies regarding wages, governing processes, and voting regulations, among other things. Many of these social and structural determinants of health such as redlining have their roots in historic injustice, which manifests today in the form of healthcare disparities that we see. So given that gun violence disproportionately affects black youth and knowing that historic injustices have influenced this, the study tried to investigate pat whether um, patterns of modern day farm related violence in Atlanta were contributing to this in order to identify areas for intervention with the goal of reducing gun violence. So the study consisted of two components looking at different populations. Both components were retrospective reviews that looked at patients presenting between 2016 to 2021 with firearm related injuries. First component of the study looked at adult patients presenting to Grady Hospital, while the second part looked at patients between the ages of 11 to 21 years presenting to Atlanta area hospitals, including Grady, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and Atlanta Medical Center before it um, closed. Variables of interest were patient demographics, geospatial location, injury characteristics, hospital course, and clinical outcomes. So when we looked at results from Grady by itself, we saw that there was a total of 31,527 trauma victims during our study period, of which 7,836 were victims of violence. And more than half of those were due to firearm injury at 4,323. Among victims of firearm related violence, 88% were male and 86% were black. Among black firearm victims, 36% were below the age of 24. Mortality among firearm injury patients was 15%. Of those who died, 78% were black, and among them, 31% were younger than 24. We did a separate analysis where we looked at where our patients lived using the Distressed Communities Index. So the Distress Communities Index is a tool that compares the economic well-being of U.S. areas by zip codes uh, based on five-year data from the American Community Survey. Specifically, uh, the factors it looks at are um, percentage of adults without a high school diploma, vacant housing percentage, unemployment rate, poverty rate, percent change in employment, and percent change in business establishments, as well as median household income compared to the metro area. Uh, it combines these seven components into a uh, composite score that ranges from one to 100 with higher numbers indicating higher distress. And then that's broken down into quintiles as shown on the um, at the bottom left of the image, um, going from prosperous to comfortable to mid-tier and then at risk and finally distressed. We found that in our cohort, the percentage of Black victims of firearm violence who were living in um, at risk or distressed communities was 65% compared to 37% of white victims. When looking at um, 11 to 21 year old patients presenting with firearm injuries to hospitals within Atlanta, we saw a total of 1,453 injury victims of which 87% were male and 87% were black, which is very similar to the, um, excuse me, to the percentages seen for firearm related injury victims of all ages that we saw at Grady. Uh, mortality for this younger cohort of patients was about 
So overall, our results painted a fairly clear picture that firearm-related injury victims in the Atlanta area are most commonly young Black males who make up the largest group of victims by far. Additionally, Black victims of firearm injury are more likely to live in economically distressed or at-risk communities. And knowing this information allowed for the formation of a plan to try to address this issue, and that plan has been IV, which stands for Interrupting Violence in Youth and Young Adults. This is a hospital-based violence intervention program that's been implemented at Grady since the beginning of this year. Um, its goal is to reduce re-injury and retaliatory behavior among victims of gun violence and help facilitate recovery after injury. So the image on the left shows the typical flow of IV. <clears throat> so patients who present to the hospital after firearm-related injury between the ages of 14 to 44 get a consult from the IV team. Patients are visited at the bedside by a violence intervention specialist. Uh, these people are credible messengers with lived experiences tied to gun violence. They've either experienced it themselves or they um, know someone who has experienced gun violence. So they're able to meaningfully connect with people during their hospitalization. Uh, they meet with patients during um, this golden moment of time, which is a time immediately after injury where um, people may be more receptive to um, talking about their injury and, and what led up to it and what they can do in the future to prevent something like this from happening. Uh, the violence intervention specialist conduct a needs assessment to identify what sort of things the patient may benefit from immediately and in the long term to help prevent re-injury and to help with recovery. And this includes things like mental and behavioral health services, job training, mentorship, and other factors. While the patient is still in the hospital, the uh, case management team within the hospital tries to get access to these services for the patient. And then when the patient is discharged, there's a warm handoff to community partners to continue services. Um, at this point, there's around 50 community partners who are involved with this, providing things like um, mental health, but also things like, um, like art and music therapy, mentorship, legal aid, um, there's a whole variety of services. And then over the long term, um, we have to collect data about IV patients to monitor outcomes over time. Um, IV has been quite successful up to now. Up to um, There's 126 patients who have been eligible for these services, and 125 of them have actually signed up to receive them, which kind of speaks to the, the need that um, people have for these services and to the way in which our violence intervention specialists are connecting with people and, and getting them hooked up with these services. IV functions on principles illustrated by the social ecological model for violence prevention. The social ecological model is a framework that can be used for understanding a variety of social phenomena, including violence. Uh, it assumes that a person's risk of experiencing violence or whatever phenomenon is being studied is dependent on this interplay of factors that occur at different levels. Specifically, they use the individual relationship, community, and societal levels. Because of this interplay, it's important to focus on multiple levels rather than just the individual when trying to produce effective violence prevention strategies. Ivy tries to implement positive changes at all four levels of the social ecological model to help reduce violence in vulnerable populations. Overall, this study supports that Black youth and young adults are disproportionately impacted by firearm-related violence in Atlanta, and it led to the development of the IV hospital-based violence intervention program to help provide services to vulnerable populations. We hope that these services help to break the cycle of violence and reduce health inequality in our communities. So thanks everyone for giving me the chance to talk and a big thanks to everyone who's helped make this possible. Um, hello everyone, my name is Carlos Aldana. I'm a PGY6 in infectious diseases. I recently um, started a position as the HIV medical advisor for the state and I will be staying as faculty. Um, and I will be presenting our work investigating clusters among Hispanic and Latinos. I'm able to advance my slides. Okay, there we go. These are my disclosures. And uh, let's start with some background. Annual new HIV diagnosis among Hispanic and Latinos in Georgia have increased since at least 2014. Um, this last portion of the figure um, around the COVID-19 uh, pandemic underestimates what's really happening. And actually with preliminary data from our, from our surveillance colleagues, we are seeing that these trends are starting to 
revert um, to normal patterns. The highest new diagnoses are in Fulton County and Cobb County, but we've also seen a steady increase in the East Metro area. This is Winnett, Newton, and Rockdale counties. These diagnoses are primarily around adolescents and young adults, ages 18 to 34. And overall, in the past 10 years, when compared to other racial and ethnic groups, in Hispanic and Latino men, the rate of diagnosis of HIV increased by 13% between 2010 and 2019. This is a cost contrast to decreasing rates among black and white groups. So in the spring of 2021, my mentor, Dr. David Holland, contacted me to support the Fulton County Board of Health's effort in responding to five HIV molecular clusters in the uh, metro area. And I will not be discussing our HIV molecular uh, program. This, uh, I understand that this, uh, this um, can be complex at times and, it, and I would be doing it on injustice and trying to discuss that in, in eight minutes, but I'm happy to, to answer questions if, 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 if we have some. Um, so let's review the five networks that were identified through our molecular uh, cluster program. The networks were um, in size from four to 45 members. The majority were male. The majority were identified as Hispanic or Latino. This cluster involved at least eight counties. The majority uh, reported male-to-male -male sexual contact, and there was a continuous uh, uh, growth in these clusters. So, the Georgia Department of Public Health partnered with CDC and the four local health districts, Fulton, Winnet, COP, and the CAP, along with selected community partners. These are the uh, Latino Community Fund and Latino Link. And launch an investigation with the goal to identify barriers and facilitators to accessing HIV prevention and care services among Hispanic and Latino gay and bisexual male through a rapid qualitative assessment. And this work was recently published in the MMWR earlier this, this year. So we conducted qualitative interviews with 65 service providers across Metro Atlanta. This include clinicians, CBO staff, and health department staff. We also met with 29 Hispanic and Latino gay and bisexual men, including people with and without HIV, people that were engaged or not engaged in care, and people born inside and outside of the US. We recruited providers through state and local health department staff and peer uh, referrals. This included leadership program management, management, HIV and ID clinicians, pharmacists, case managers, patient navigators, peer counselors, outreach staff, et cetera. And we also recruited the community members through CBO referrals and um, peer referrals. And we also went to clubs. So let's highlight the barriers and gaps to accessing medical and social services in the Hispanic and Latino community. When asking Hispanic and Latino gay and bisexual men about sexual and uh, drug use behavior, many reported having multiple sexual partners in the past year, ranging from zero to 40. Also, alcohol use disorder was reported by several participants. The most common mentioned barrier was a challenge to accessing services um, where language barriers. Spanish-speaking staff at health centers was minimal. At times, language barrier resulted in poor patient-provider interactions, with a few participants saying that they felt pushed aside when the provider realized that they couldn't speak English. Providers used language line, Google Translate, or other in-person interpreter to communicate, but many spoke how it is difficult to communicate using the services, and one HIV provider said, trust is lost in translation. In terms of structural barriers, participants endorsed fear of accessing services because they felt that this could trigger immigration services and lead to a deportation. There's also transportation barriers for people that live far away in Gwinnett and Cobb counties. They are unable to take time off of work and they have too many responsibilities to make it to the appointments. They are often uninsured and they cannot afford services or perceive that they are not eligible to these services based on immigration and insurance status. There's low HIV and STD awareness uh, in providers across Metro Atlanta. Many providers didn't know where to refer clients that speak Spanish or were um, um, uninsured or didn't have a, a legal status in, in the US. In terms of PrEP barriers, there is a low awareness of HIV and STD prevention in the communities. 
the provider, uh, the, the clients felt that there was a negative connotation of PrEP and, and fear of being perceived as promiscuous. And uh, other, other participants said that uh, they didn't feel that they needed PrEP because they were uh, in monogamous relationships. And finally, barriers to HIV uh, treatment included difficulties continuing uh, completing the Ryan White and ADAP paperwork. Uh, often um, reported delays in linking to care due to limited availability or bureaucratic processes, especially for uns uninsured clients, and overall reported difficulties navigating the U.S. healthcare system, um, particularly in those that were recent immigrants. Taken all together, all these barriers to medical and social services, including HIV prevention and treatment, result in the marginalization of Hispanic and Latino gay and bisexual men. And as a community organization staff so pointedly put it, our community cannot continue to live in the shadows. So after this work in collaboration with CDC and the health departments, we put together four um, buckets of recommendations. The first, one, the first one is addressing language justice by intentionally trying to recruit bilingual staff to our organization and translating materials into Spanish. Second, partnerships with strengthened partnerships with community-based organization for outreach activities, including cluster detection and response, enhancing service deliver, uh, delivery models that include uh, transportation assistance, financial assistance, but for the Hispanic and Latino community, also immigration and legal assistance can be quite optimal. And finally, HIV prevention and treatment messaging that is in Spanish. This is an example of a campaign that we launched in 2022, highlighting that people can access sexual health services regardless of their insurance and immigration status. And we have been heard. Uh, positive Impact Health Centers last year released a series of um, uh, positions that required uh, bilingual staff to, to many levels. We've also launched the Stop HIV ATL website um, in, uh, that it's uh, in English and Spanish. And these are some examples from um, Winnet County's um, uh, materials that are in Spanish. And this is my good friend, uh, Umberto. Furthermore, we've obtained federal funding to launch a, uh, uh, through our MOEC FAR, to launch the project that we've titled Creemos, that uh, means believe, we believe in, in Spanish. And what we're doing is we're using Georgia Department of Public Health surveillance data from these clusters and um, launching a marketing campaign in Spanish that is created with the assistance of Latino Community Fund, advertising medical and social services. But we take it a step further and we link them to uh, a status neutral bilingual bicultural navigator that it's uh, staff of Latino Link. And um, his name is Umberto. Umberto has lived experiences as an immigrant, as someone that lives with HIV, as someone that struggled with, um, with uh, mental health. And we've trained it uh, with the support of my colleague, Dr. James Scott, on where to refer patients, what is PrEP, what is, uh, what is HIV, what are some barriers that the Hispanic and Latino community faces, and where can they access uh, this, some of these services. I also, um, uh, I'm a photographer on the side and we um, took some photos of Raul across uh, Metro Atlanta to guide some of the uh, social media campaign that hopefully we'll be launching this week. And people can text, email, um, uh, send requests for Raul, rather for, to Raul, to other requests, uh, PrEP, te uh, HIV tests, STD tests, and linkage to um, um, HIV services. And this is a summary of the responses. I'm not going to go through the uh, with the table in its entirety, but it goes from very basic things as translating materials, launching uh, social media campaigns, to actually hiring bilingual staff at, at, at positions, especially in Fulton County. We have a wonderful sexual health educator that it's bilingual. Um, so with that, I conclude. There's a lot of people to thank about this 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 work, um, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions.